It's good to see everybody. My name is Jeff Vesta, and uh, it's good to see all of you out here tonight. Let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> just thank you for tonight. And I ask, Lord, that I would uh, speak the words that you give me through your Holy Spirit that I would speak only your words. And I pray that all of us here, including myself, that we would have ears to hear what you want to say tonight, that we'd have minds that would take it in and understand it, but more importantly, we would have open hearts to receive what you want to share tonight, and that through this, we would draw closer to you. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Amen is a nice Hebrew word that means, so be it, Lord. So all of you just came into agreement whether you knew what amen meant or not. As a kid growing up, I thought amen was the end. And it was always confusing when the pastor kept going. Didn't he just say amen? Why are we still sitting here? Anyway, speaking of when I was in younger days in 1977, um, I gave my life to the Lord um, I guess you could say that was the time that it stuck. But like the first time when I was in high school and the second time in college, there was something missing in my life. And I believe that can be found in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Most of you probably know this almost by heart. It's a very common scripture verse. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The missing ingredient in my life was discipleship. Nobody um, sat down to teach me anything other than I got a pamphlet that said save for sure, which was important because the devil likes to lie to us. He likes to tell you, oh, you didn't really mean that. It meant nothing. But then there are some things that we need to start to know. What I knew about Christianity was this. There was this thing called Christmas where we got presents and a thing called Easter where we got all new clothes to wear and go to church, including, uh, as for me, a kid, the fake neckties that went up to your throat and no matter what choked us because our collars are always too tight. But um, I read a report by the Barnard Group that in 2022, only 20% of church-going people in America knew what the Great Commission was and understood what it meant. 20%, 2022. That, and then 31% had heard of it, but they thought it had to do with evangelism. Now that's surprising. And then there was 49% of churchgoers didn't even know there was a Great Commission. That is scary. That is scary. Do you realize that in our, in our Bibles, in the New Testament, the word Christian only appears three times? Because a lot of people think the Great Commission is about go out and make Christians. It only appears three times, and two of the times are probably negative. Only Peter, in one of his letters, writes Christian in a positive light. The word disciple appears 230 times in the Gospels. Almost always connected with Jesus. <laughs> 228 times in Acts. That is, says something to us right there. Yes, Jesus did tell his disciples, you will be my witnesses to the end of the earth. Meaning they're going to go and witness about what has happened in their life. They're going to go share salvation. But he said in his commission, in his, the big order he gave, Go, therefore, and make disciples. How important is discipleship making? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, the enemy hates it. He hates the thought of young people, of the older people discovering the need for discipleship. They, he hates it. And if you take the children of Israel from the time they left Egypt all the way through their troubles in the desert and you know, not trusting God and making golden idols... And then finally getting to the promised land, they send 12 spies in. Ten of them had eyesight problems. Yeah. I don't know if it was glaucoma or what it was, 
But a couple weeks back, Pastor Mike gave a great message on perception. And Jake last week also talked about perception. They kept saying, everything's too big, can't handle it. And only two guys had 20-20 vision. They said, hey, wait a minute. The guy who did all those plagues on Egypt, wait till these guys in Canaan get a taste of that. Unfortunately, they weren't listened to. They had to wait 40 years in the desert. They finally got into the promised land. And you know, you ever notice in the promised land what happened with the children of Israel? Right up until the time they were carried off into Babylon. Up and down, up and down. They're good with God, they're in their trouble with God. They're good with God, now they have problems with God. And all because of idol worship. They had a big, big problem with worshiping idols. Almost every time you turn around, just when they think they got it made, no, they got in trouble. And then they did one of the most amazing things that I could ever believe possible. There came a point near the end of the book of Judges where they stood before God and said, we want to be like the rest of the world. They did. They said, we want a king like the rest of the world has. Can you imagine? I know our pastors would never get up and say that. Our pastors get up here and say, you need to have your identity rooted in Christ. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and going out and, and you know, words of wisdom, praying for healing and all that kind of stuff. There's nobody in this church that stands up and says, let's be like the rest of the world. They did that. They said, let's be like the rest of the world. They said, God, it's even in your word, in the law. It says we could have kings. And he said, only because it's a bad idea, but I put it there because in case you're stupid and ask for it. <laughs> okay, it's a paraphrase. <laughs> Don't ask me chapter and verse, but that's what basically it was there for. They got Saul, not so good. David was pretty good, he, although he had issues. Solomon comes along. He starts off great, but then, I'm sorry, Solomon didn't see a woman from another country he didn't love, want to marry, make a concubine, and let bring in their idols, their pagan worship, set up shop through all of Israel. Boy, talk about setting up a country to fail. He dies, the country splits in two. Now it's two of them going up and down, northern and southern Israel, Judah and Israel going up and down. God finally says, enough already. You're going to captivity. Babylon, take them. And so they did. They get to Babylon. According to Jewish history and tradition, the prophet Daniel and other prophets and some of the Zadik, which is the righteous ones, they all got together. There were some good people there that didn't like what was going on. They were speaking against it. They got together and said, what is the issue with our people? From the time of Moses, we've had God's word. Why are we doing this over? What's wrong with the people? They said, you know what we needed? We needed to go a couple thousand years in the future and hear Pastor Mike and Jake's message on perception because the people had a problem with perception. There's a Hebrew word called olam, and olam means this room. It means this building. It means the neighborhood. It means the city, the state, the country, the world. It's what we see. Olam can be the situation at work or a situation at home. It's what we see. It's what we perceive. And they said the problem is our people keep seeing olam. They need to see devar, which is a Hebrew word meaning word, particularly the word. It says we got the word right here. God's Torah, which means instructions. We have his manual on how to live a life holy and separate from the rest of the world how come our people aren't doing it? Well, they took a peek into the scriptures. In Leviticus 23, it says there's this thing called the Sabbath day. And on the Sabbath day, they were to hold, according to the word, a holy convocation. They were to get together, and then what? They said, okay, we're to get together and worship, but that would be a great time to teach the people the word. So they decided to set up little community centers throughout Babylon, wherever there were Jewish people. We're going to set up these little community centers. We're going to have the people come together and hear the word of God. We're going to take the word of God. We're going to divide it up into weekly portions. And we're going to have the word read. We're going to have somebody teach it to the people at these areas where they gather together. Later, those areas that they gathered together would take on the Greek word, which means gather together, synagogue. So every time you hear the word synagogue, it means gather together. They were going to gather together. 
They were going to hear the word of God. They were going to have the word of God taught to them. They were going to be told how to live holy lives, how to be separate, how to follow God's instructions. And it worked so well, it's only lasted 2,600 some years. The Jewish people have never gone back to idolatry. In fact, they would get in troubles with the Greeks and the Romans later on when they wanted to do, oh, I don't know, set up idols in the temple. They took on the Greeks, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, and said, no, you're not going to do that in our temple. And they got in trouble with several Roman emperors because they wanted to sit statues up in there. And they said, no. This was one of the greatest plans, if you want to call it this, I do, discipleship training ever. They got people together once a week, hear the word of God, be taught the word of God, and then said, now go out and practice the word of God. Live the word of God. Suddenly, they lost all interest in idols. Discipleship, the enemy, boy, he hates it. You know, because he, you know, he just had such fun. Here at this church, World Harvest, the first time I came here, the second time, I can't remember, to um, uh, meet with Pastor Bob, I'm sitting out in the lobby and I'm looking at the wall there and I'm like, salvation, water baptism, Holy Spirit, cell life, next step, these different classes, level, and then finally go into the world. Discipleship training. I thought, I needed that bad. I needed that bad in my life. And to top that off, I'm, I was told, Birch, where are you? Aren't the young people, some of the young people doing this Exodus program? Kind of like breaking away from the world, just like they, when they left Egypt, and getting to the things of God. Pastor Jake wrote a book before he left called The 40-Day Transition. I understand there's some people doing it right now. Peggy and I did it last fall. It is a great book to say, let's break away from the world, olam, and look to devour the word. It is a great thing. It, it really is, and boy, I tell you, it should be something that we all consider. The report that I mentioned earlier said there's one other interesting thing. People often confuse membership with discipleship. They're two different things. But we here have an opportunity to really grow as disciples. Well, what is a disciple? In the biblical terms, a disciple is a student who has entered into a, like an apprenticeship-like relationship with their teacher. In other words, I'm going to learn from you for a period of time, and in the Jewish model, it was with the rabbi, I'm going to be a carbon copy of that rabbi when I'm done learning from him. And then I'm going to have students that are going to become carbon copies of me, who will ultimately be a carbon copy of the original master. There was even a rabbi in 55 CE, I always like CE, AD for those older folks, who said, Rabbi Shaul of Asia, Asia Minor, how would you like to have a name like Shaul? Um, he said, therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Oh, some of you might be suspicious. Rabbi Shaul, that's the Hebrew name. In English, it would be Saul. And Saul mainly went by his Roman name, Paul. And he wrote that to the church at Corinth. I like in... Um, Okay, guys, don't pick on me. I did this one time at, at Cell Group, and all the guys in my group gave me a business about doing the tr passion translation. So just don't go there. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1 1, in the passion translation. I love this. I want you to pattern your lives after me just as I pattern mine after Christ. And that is the whole goal of a discipleship teacher-student relationship is to enter into a short period of time of intense training and learn to be like the master. Boy, could have I used that back in the 70s. So that is kind of the biblical model, disciples teaching others. And you know, we can have models of what it looks like. We can have definitions, books, seminars, programs. But there's something that is needed to make it work, and that is to become a three-dimensional disciple. The first dimension of being a disciple, when I hit you with some Hebrew words tonight, so hang on. <laughs> the first word is a daily, having a life that you have daily teshuva. So what is teshuva? It's repentance. Now, just like when Pastor Todd was here and um, we did the baptisms, Pastor Bob, the Saturday before, told us about there were 
things called mikvah in the, uh, the time of Jesus, and they were like baptisms, and there were many different kinds. But there was, the initial, there was that one baptism unto salvation. Same thing with repentance. There is the one time you come to the Lord, you confess your sins, you accept Jesus as your Savior. That is your first initial repentance. But in teshuva, it is a daily thing. And teshuva, well, let's put it this way. I'm going to get ahead of myself. In Webster's Dictionary for Repentance, it's simply... You feel bad, you did something wrong, you admit to it, and then you say you're not going to do it anymore. Okay. Teshuva puts it a little deeper. You have deep regret that you sinned against the king of the universe. It's just not simply, I made my wife mad because I tracked my shoes through the house, which she would say I should have deep regret. <laughs> Especially if she just cleaned the floors. But really, seriously, Teshuva says, I have deep regret because I've offended God. And that the next thing is, I must verbally confess it. I must say it out loud. I shouldn't just go to my office or somewhere by myself and say, am we good? There's something about saying it out loud that adds some kind of importance to us. It makes it permanent. It makes it sincere. It's also a good idea sometimes, as the scriptures tells us, to confess our sins one to another. It, it changes something. And then the last step in teshuva is to recognize there's only two directions. I either go toward the world, no offense to you people over here, or I go toward God. You guys can go yes. <laughs> But that's it. There's only two directions. There's no A, B, and C, D, and F. There's I'm either going toward the world or I'm going toward God. So daily I get up and I say to myself, today I'm going to walk toward God. That's daily teshuva. Every day I got to do that. And along with daily teshuva, there's another thing. I should add this one point here real quickly is that disciples need to recognize the fact that when you come to the Lord, each of us come, shall we say, with luggage that we don't want. We've opened our doors of our lives to things that we don't want and we don't need, or sometimes we pick stuff up we don't need, and we need to get rid of them, either through counseling, through deliverance. We, at our church here, we have the Freedom Ministries that offers sozos to get free from that stuff because if you hang on to it the devil's going to just use it against you the whole time you're trying to be a good disciple another part of a of daily teshuva is realizing to make teshuva a real part of my life i must live the shema as well the shema was a prayer that jewish men said every morning and every evening they might have said it the third time i can't remember it goes back to second temple times in other words this is something Jesus and his disciples might have prayed. It goes something like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And it actually goes on a lot longer than that, but I'm going to give you the condensed version. It comes right out of the law. It comes right out of the Torah. They picked that up. They said, let's make this a prayer. We're going to pray every day. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandments? He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And then he liked to always add things. So he said, I'm going to just add a little more to it. Love your neighbors yourself. So as we're walking toward God, if we want to make it easy, add love. Love God, you're going to find, I want to go to God. Because if you don't love God, you're going to ask yourself, why am I going that direction? Jesus said this in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love is a distinguishing characteristic of a disciple and we must have it. The second uh, dimension of a three-dimensional disciple is daily Pentecost. What? Didn't we get baptized with the baptism of the Holy Spirit one time and one time only? Well, Paul would seem to indicate, yes, there is that initial baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
But then he wrote to the church at Ephesus. He pointed out this. In Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, looking up that word, filled with, filled with the Spirit in the Greek, I noticed several, several scholars kept going down and down and down said, this is an ongoing process. You get filled with the Spirit, you keep going. You keep going. You get up every day. Holy Spirit, I need you. I need to be filled again today. I, I'm not going to try to do this on what happened yesterday. I need a fresh filling today because today is going to be different than yesterday. Still the same Holy Spirit. And he knows what I mean by that. But I need it. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll make a little confession here. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry up there. <laughs> They're like, whoa. Um, this is a weak point in my life. This is a weak point. I come from a nice evangelical background. I was talking to Pastor Bob before church about this. I come from a very evangelical background where the baptism, of the Pentecost, the original Pentecost was a one and done deal. And yeah, you have the Holy Spirit with you. And yeah, there might be a miracle once in a while. And if somebody gets what they think is a word of knowledge, it's really just a little insight. You know, there's always an explanation. But so I grew up kind of a little resisting this idea of the Holy Spirit being in me and being in charge and doing things through me. And my wife is sitting there, amen, he did, he was this way. <laughs> and, uh, but it's true, I gotta admit it. And so a lot of it is new to me to this, to this day. It's, it's like new, it's scary, it's exciting, it can be fun, it can be like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? The last time I spoke, I know the Holy Spirit was work because there were times I thought I was standing up here and watching me. I'm like, who is that guy going back and forth? He's awful ner nervous and fidgety. But we need to lead a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, operating in the gifts of the Spirit. And we need to remember as disciples this, it's not automatic. You can resist the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells us that. We can offend the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. So it's not automatic that we just go along with what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. We have to be willing vessels. The third dimension is daily sitting at the feet of the master. About 200 years before the time of Jesus, a man named Yose ben Yozer said this, let your house be a meeting place for the rabbis and cover yourself in the dust of their feet and drink in their words thirstily. Now today that doesn't sound like, well, what do you mean by that? But if you think of the story of Martha and Mary, when they invited Jesus to come, and where did Mary plunk herself down? At the feet of Jesus. That was the spot reserved for disciples. <coughs> Jesus didn't rebuke her for it. The other disciples didn't complain about it, and they were not shy about complaining about things they didn't like. And yet there she was at his feet. And of course, the thing about the dust meant they wore sandals. And if his feet were dusty and he moved, you might got a little dust kicked on you. And he said, don't matter. Let yourself be covered in the dust and drink in their words like you're just dying of thirst. Well, today, we're lucky Yeah, pastors wear shoes. It's a good thing, too. No. <laughs> Here you go. You can sit at the feet of this anytime you want. And you need to do it daily and drink in the words like you're just, you just can't get enough. You just need to have that in your life. I would add just one other thing on this about sitting at the feet of your master is this. is How do you see Jesus, by the way? Well, I see him as my Lord. What does Lord mean to you? Now, I don't know. I can't speak for you, but for me, I grew up, like I said, in a background where some words just were words you said at church. I don't remember anybody saying Lord at home. I don't remember anybody saying Lord at school. So I went to a public school. I don't remember anybody out on the playground 
at school or in the backyard saying Lord. It was a church word. I don't remember anybody saying hallelujah, praise God, or anything like that. And so when I got to church, it was Lord was like Mr. I was at a conference one time where this guy kept saying master. Well, the master said this, and the master said that. Somebody asked him about it finally, and he said, like me, it was a church word. He said, but master was kind of a gut check. He's the master. I'm the disciple. He's in charge. I'm not. And so whether you say Lord or master, have that gut check that he's the one in charge. And, uh, you know, the wonderful thing happens when we do that. When, I don't know if you remember this. When you first got saved, there were a lot of rules. You can't do this. You can't do that. You got to do this. You got to do that. You know, and there were good rules about, you know, the way we behave toward one another, the way we behave toward God. But the closer we get to God, suddenly it's like, I don't have to do it. I get to do it. I get to do these wonderful things. I get to be generous in my giving. I don't have to be. And then it goes another step further. I want to do those things. I want to do what's pleasing. And so the more we learn, the more we sit at his feet, the more we get taught by him, the more closer to him we want to be. Today, I would say the church in general, obviously by the, that report I gave you earlier, is in real need of three-dimensional, real disciples, disciples of actions. The world is in need of a real deal church of action, not of sitting back and doing anything, not just a church that can explain things, but nothing goes on. You know, there's a lot of churches that have, you go in there, you can have an explanation. There's a lot of churches, you can drive by them at any given time, and you know if there's cars there, well, they're having a meeting. Or it's Sunday, and they're having church service. But how many churches do you go by and say, I've heard about this church. Wonder what's going on in there. See, the church should be a something of action that people are noticing. And it won't be a church of action if the people are disciples that are not fully dimensional in what they do. We have to be a fully dimensional people. Otherwise, the church becomes a country club without the golf course. Ever hear that? <laughs> I've heard that. Somebody else, somebody else added, says, not only without the golf club, or without the golf course, they're without the swimming pool and the tennis courts. I don't want to pay, you know, to go to a place like that. I want to give to a place that's impacting the world. Pastor Todd Smith writes in his book, he sat down. Many churches and ministries are focused mostly on building their attendance numbers and not so much on developing and training and equipping an army. And I would add my own words here, an army of disciples that can penetrate deep within the gates of hell. I don't know about anybody else, but I often thought that phrase, and the gates of hell will not prevail, a funny thing the way most of the time I hear people use it. They would use it like, well, you're having a bad time, don't worry, the gates of hell will not prevail. And I'm like, you mean the enemy is picking up a gate and attacking me with it? I'm having the bad time, I'm coming under attack and he's beating me with a gate? I've never seen a war movie, especially like a, a, a movie of the Middle Ages where there's this big castle and there's the army on the outside, duck, they're coming with the gate at us. <laughs> the gate was meant to keep the other side out. And when Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against you, as fully equipped, fully trained disciples, when we go out, we're going to come up against the strongholds of the enemy, and we're being told as fully equipped, fully trained disciples, they're not going to stand up. They're going to come down, and the captives are going to be set free. Yeah. Don't you want that? So, let's be fully equipped and fully trained disciples. Remember, this church has discipleship training. Are you taking advantage of it? Or has that wall back there become familiar? Don't let that become familiar. Go out there and look at it from time to time. Ask yourself from time to time, where am I at on that wall? Because this world needs us to be people of action, disciples. 
couple of last points here. Disciples are called to action, but in order to action, we must die to ourselves. In John chapter 12, starting in verse 23, the master says this. Now the time is near for the Son of Man to be glorified. Let me make this clear. A single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it is dropped to the ground and dies. Because then it will sprout and produce a great harvest of wheat. All because one grain died. The person who loves his life and pampers himself will miss true life. But the one who detaches from his life and from this world and abandons himself to me will find true life and enjoy it forever. He goes on to say this. If you want to be my disciple, follow me and you will go where I am going. And if you truly follow me as my disciple, my father will shower his favors upon your life. But you got to die first. That came first. You got to die first. You got to let the Holy Spirit, just, you know, be like an onion. Just peel off layer after layer after layer of what is not needed in our lives so that we can be a true disciple of his. And as Paul wrote in Galatians, it's no longer I live, but Christ who lives within me. So before you can be a true disciple of the Lord, the Lord must truly own you, completely own you. One other thing here, I know I keep saying that because I'm nervous and I don't know what else to say, so one other thing. I'd like to say the Lord just keeps adding this stuff on, but it's already there in the message. Do you know it is important that we meet together like this? I already talked about the, what happened with the Jewish people in, in captivity. Um, Hebrews 10, 24, or let's go to 25. Paul, uh, whoever wrote Hebrews, some people think it's Paul, some people think it was somebody else. Doesn't matter, but it says this. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing because we need each other. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. Now, this was written in Greek. And where it says, meeting together, coming together. Synagogue. <laughs> Just like, you know, he's, he's drawing back on, because this is a letter written to Messianic believers. And he's deliberately saying, listen, you know, there was a purpose the synagogue was met, made. It was to train and equip people to go out into the world and withstand what the devil has to offer. And he's saying, let's keep doing that. Let's not neglect the coming together. And so we must do that. And besides, where else is iron going to sharpen iron? And by the way, that doesn't mean one disciple gets to discipline another disciple. I mean, that could happen. You know, if you're in error and somebody lovingly shows you something. I used to get together with this one brother in the Lord and uh, on a regular basis. And he, when we would be done with each other, he would look at me and says, he would say, oh, man, do I feel sharpened because of you. And I'd think, no, I'm sharpened because of you. And he goes, well, iron sharpens iron. We were learning from each other. We were growing together. And uh, I missed that time with him. So anyway, and a lot of times in cell group that can, can happen, you know. You get a chance to do a little sharpening with each other. And uh, it doesn't have to be painful. But we do find that we go from one glory to another glory. One level of discipleship to the next level. And so... I'm going to pull out a different Bible. This is my chronological Bible. <laughs> now, what, what would be so important I read in chronological order? I hope I can find it quickly because I forgot to mark this one. It's in November 19th for those of you that are worried about where it's at. <laughs> so I'm jumping way ahead. Um, then Jesus came and said to them, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
And whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these will be the signs that accompanies those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, they will drink deadly poison, and it will not hurt them at all, and they will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. That was Mark and Matthew put together. That's why I did it that way. There's a lot of action words there. Go, proclaim, make, baptize, drive out, speak, hear, and, and you know, I mean, it just goes on. When you hear the Great Commission put together, it's like, man, when the Lord says go, I'm going to be busy. Not wondering what to do next. A three-dimensional disciple lives a life of action in every way possible, touching his church community, and that church community touches the greater community. Amy, could you minister to us with a little music? Let's not forget one important thing here as disciples. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. We're not to go out and bash other people because they either don't believe the way we do or they don't believe at all. Our job is not bashing but it's against the spiritual forces of evil. So if you're not living daily in teshuva, I'm not daily walking to God, that means I'm going the other direction because it doesn't give me any other option, which means I am going toward the world, it means I am going toward sin, which means I'm giving the enemy a cheap victory. If I'm not living daily in Pentecost, if I'm not daily asking the Holy Spirit to fill me anew, that means I am going to go out in that day and I'm going to face the day leaning on my own strength, on my own understanding. I think there's a verse in Proverbs. <laughs> Lean not on your own understanding. I, I uh, remember Sarah, Pastor Sarah, she's not here tonight. Anyway, Pastor Sarah said one time that she'd become familiar with that verse and God ordered her to do a study on it. And, you know, sometimes when we become familiar with verses, that's a good idea to do is to, to kind of study it again. But if I go out every day and I'm not living in a daily Pentecost mode, oh, I'm going on my strength, my understanding. No, thank you. Um, and lastly, if I'm not living daily sitting at the master's feet, basically I'm going out in spiritual battle unarmed. And the enemy does not believe my bluff. He knows when we go out unarmed. And he'll be there to attack us and we won't have anything to fight back with discipleship it's a lifestyle of learning and growing I don't know I, I hope this is good news to you all there's no retirement so whether you're starting the discipleship in my age group or up or you're one of these young people and you're just starting the journey it's a great journey and you wouldn't want any other let us pray Father, I pray that you speak to each of us tonight <coughs> about the health of our discipleship. Lord, show me, <coughs> show all of us tonight the health of our discipleship. Where are we at? Are we one-dimensional, two-dimensional? And Lord, if we're three-dimensional, are we satisfied or are we growing? Have we become comfortable or familiar with the fact that here there is discipleship training and I don't need to worry about it? Or am I always hungry for the next step? Am I always hungry for more? Father, I pray that you'd burn in each of us a desire to be three-dimensional in our discipleship. That we would always live in that daily teshuva, that we would always live wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that every day we would take time to sit at the feet of our Master and our Lord, Jesus. Father, speak to our hearts and show us and draw us closer to you through the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>